The University of Guam, Center for Island Sustainability, leads and supports the transition of our island region toward a sustainable future through research, education, protection and preservation, growth, partnerships, and inspiration. Follow us on our journey to creating a sustainable future for our island and our world. Hafadeh, welcome to week two of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. My name is Lauren Swadell and I'm the Guam Green Growth Coordinator from the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability and I'll be your virtual MC today. Today is the second uh, session of the 11th annual conference that UOG is hosting. And while the conference team and I wish we could all be together in person, we are excited that this new virtual conference platform gives us the rare opportunity to bring Islanders and allies together from all around the world. Last week, we had over 400 conference attendees from over 59 countries, states, and territories. And we had over 3.4 thousand views on Facebook. Thank you for participating and watching. For those of you joining us on Zoom, thank you for registering and participating in our conference. Feel free to comment in the chat box and direct your questions to the Q&A moderator. Please try using the chat box now to say hi and let us know who you are and where you're from. Also, if you click on the three little dots in the top right of your image or video, you can edit your name to show where you're from. For those of you viewing on live stream or a recording, thank you for watching and I hope you are inspired to register to engage live with other conference participants. You can register at our website at uog.edu slash CIS and it's also on your screen right here. Let's say a quick hello to the 11th president of the University of Guam and our conference co-chair, Dr. Thomas W. Kreis. Hi, Dr. Kreis. And a quick hello to Senior Vice President and Provost, Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez. Hi, Dr. Enriquez. And a quick hello to the Chairwoman of our UOG Island Sustainability Community and Advisory Board. Ms. Jackie Marotti is also the Senior Vice President and Chief of Communications and Social Responsibility at the Bank of Guam. The University of Guam would like to thank our conference partnering organizers the offices of the Governor and Lieutenant Governor of Guam and the local 2030 Islands Network. We will also like to thank our Guam Green Growth members, conference sponsors, and strategic partners. And I'd like to acknowledge our university and local dignitaries who have registered. Please say hi to everyone in the chat box if you're online today. We are also pleased to have so many representatives from many regional and international island organizations. Today is the second week of the conference series and we will continue the series every Friday at 9 a.m. Guam time for the next several weeks. Today we'll have featured speaker Hank Rogers, Tetris entrepreneur and champion of clean energy with esteemed Amanda Ellis as moderator. Hank will give us a presentation on the importance of getting the world to commit 100 renewable energy by 2045. Please stick around afterwards and we'll have a 30 minute virtual reception where we'll get to network and focus on renewable energy in island communities. All right, so actually we want to take some time to say hello properly to the folks I gave shout outs to earlier. So we'll have Jackie Marotti say a quick hello. When is in half a day? And thank you very much for joining us this morning. And thanks again to the University of Guam for organizing this, particularly from the Center for Island Sustainability. This is really a great time of reawakening for many of us. And it's also so great to see uh, our good friend, Amanda, uh, who we had a chance to meet last year. Enjoy, listen, learn, uh, get engaged, and make sure you, you act on, on what you're about ready to learn. So thank you again very much for having us. Thank you, Jackie. And now we'll have um, a moment with Dr. Anita Enriquez. Hi, Dr. Yes, Enriquez. Hi, everyone. We're excited to have you join us. And 
equally excited to hear from our keynote speaker, Mr. Rogers. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us everything you can in today's series. Thank you again. We look forward to, to more information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Enriquez. And lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Kreis. Welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you half a day. Um, this is uh, ever more important, and I think uh, the uh, connection between sustainability and, um, and, and uh, combating the coronavirus um, is becoming more and more apparent. So uh, we have an opportunity, um, we have the time, and I'm so pleased to see so many people uh, prioritizing uh, this conference and this effort um, at this uh, challenging time. So thanks for uh, everybody, and looking forward to uh, Hank's, Hank's presentation too. Thank you, Dr. Christ, Dr. Enriquez, and Jackie Marotti for saying a few words. Now let's get started with our conference. Long ago on Guam, the center of the island was mysteriously wasting away. It was soon discovered that a giant fish was eating the land. The strongest men went out to sea to search for it, but over time could not find the fish. The women gathered together to help. They cut off their hair and wove it into a large net. They sang songs to lure the giant fish out of hiding and captured it. The men helped bring in the fish for a feast. Together, they saved Guam and secured its future for generations to come. Islands are not isolated. This is just one story of island wisdom that teaches we must all work together to face the threats to our planet and our future. Join the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability as we present the theme, Island Wisdom for a Global Future. Half a day and welcome back to the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. As island people, we remain resilient and prepared to adapt to the challenges before us. Sustainability is more important than ever, and we are proud to be continuing to move forward our sustainable actions forward as we present this conference's theme, Island Wisdom for a Global Future. Suzuas Maasi, and thank you for tuning in. Now I'd like to introduce our session moderator, Amanda Ellis. Amanda was our keynote speaker last year here in Guam, and I know is thrilled to be back with us virtually. Amanda serves as the Global Partnerships Director for the Arizona State University Global Futures Laboratory and the Hawaii and Asia Pacific Executive Director for the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability. Previous roles include Deputy Secretary in the New Zealand Foreign Ministry, Head of the New Zealand Development Agency, New Zealand Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations in Geneva and Prime Minister Special Envoy. She is a development economist by training and has held senior roles at the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and Westpac Banking Corporation. Take it away, Amanda. Hafadei <laughs> Guam, Aloha Hawaii, Kia ora. Aotearoa New Zealand and welcome islands and island supporters everywhere. I am so excited to have the honor to introduce one of the world's leading advocates to end the use of fossil fuels, Hank Rogers. And I'm wearing my 1.5 degree pin in his honor. Hank is just about my hero. He is a visionary and he's a solutionary. And when I arrived in Hawaii in 2016, having helped negotiate the UN Sustainable Development Goals and thinking about the Paris Climate Accords, I was pretty depressed. I really didn't see how we were going to get where we needed to get. And then I learned about Hawaii's 100% renewable energy commitment by 2045. And I learned about who was behind it. So thank you, Hank Rogers, for making such a huge impact. Hank is the founder and chair of the board of Blue Planet Foundation, the founder and the CEO of Blue Planet Energy, the founder and the president of Blue Planet Research, and also now the founder of the Blue Planet Alliance. He's going to tell you a lot more about all of that. 
But Hank, we can't tell you how thrilled we are to have you as keynote speaker. This is my second Island Wisdom for a Global Future Conference, and I'm delighted to be back as your biggest fan on the planet. I am so thrilled to have the honor to introduce you here today, Mr. Hank Rogers. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Hank Rogers, as Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, for such a great introduction. Oh my gosh, I hope I live up to it. Uh, a little bit about my background. I was born in the Netherlands, that's Holland to some of you. Uh, moved to New York City when I was 11, moved to Hawaii when I was 18. You can imagine moving from the city, meaning concrete and asphalt, to the beach in Hawaii uh, when you're 18 years old and learning how to surf and how to dive. You can imagine what big, how huge of a change that was. I fell in love with the ocean. I fell in love with everything about it, the coral, the fish, the surf. I mean, you name it. What, what isn't there to love? I followed up a year on the beach uh, with um, uh, University of Hawaii. I, um, my major was computer science and my minor was Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know how many of you out there can, uh, can know what role playing games are. But uh, after my stint at the University of Hawaii, I chased a girl to Japan and six years later, personal computers came out and I wrote the first role playing game in Japan, which is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. What it did for me is it not only gave me a game that I could publish, but it gave me a publishing, publishing company that I could use to publish other games. So what did I publish? Well, I wrote the first couple of games and then I started traveling around the world looking for games to bring to Japan. One of those games I found at the Consumer Electronics Show, it was called Tetris, of course. Um, so I published Tetris in Japan and Game Boy came out and I went to the Soviet Union to get the Game Boy rights. Um, <clears throat> so that's my, basically my career up until something changed my life. Well, what changed my life? Uh, first of all, what changed my life is I sold a company. I sold a company for enough money so that my wife said that I didn't have to work anymore. And theoretically, I don't have to work anymore. Unfortunately, I'm working harder today than I've ever worked. Um, a month after I sold my company, I found myself in the back of an ambulance on the way to a hospital. What was going on? I had a hundred percent blockage of the widow maker. And what does that mean? It means that if you don't get to a hospital within so many minutes, you die. And so <laughs> I, um, I'm lying in the back of the ambulance and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I haven't spent any of the money yet. That was the first thing I thought. And then the second thing I, th I thought is, no, I'm not going. I still have stuff to do. And so in the recovery room, I decided that I was going to find my missions in life because obviously under, under the conditions that I was about to die, saying that I still have stuff to do. What did I mean by that? Well, I have four children. They were already out of college and they already had jobs. So they didn't need any more, me anymore. And my wife, we already made enough money, so she didn't need me anymore. So here I am. What do I mean by I still have stuff to do? And so I decided to find my missions life in life, and I did. My first mission came to me in the back of the newspaper while I was still in the recovery room. And it was, oh, by the way, we're going to kill all the coral in the world by the end of the century. And I'm thinking, you idiots, that's imp that you can't do that. We can't do that. What's causing that? It's carbon dioxide being absorbed into the ocean, uh, causing um, ocean acidification. And ocean acidification is, is what happens when uh, the coral dissolves faster than the coral can make coral. So basically we're talking about losing all the coral in the world. So I said, okay, we have to, what's causing the carbon dioxide? And it's um, basically it's man-made internal combustion of, of oil, coal, and gas. These are all fossil fuels. And so I, I asked them, uh, I'm thinking that the mission must be to end the use of carbon-based fuel. So how do I go about doing that? Well, I decided that I was going to start a foundation that's working to, to end the use of carbon-based fuel. And the, that foundation is called the Blue Planet Foundation. Rather than me telling you what the Blue Planet Foundation does, I'm going to ask my 
seven-year-old niece, Mia, to tell you what the Blue Planet Foundation does. Can you guys play the video? Hawaii is our home. But our home is changing. Breaking news on Kauai tonight, devastating flooding, widespread damage, homes on the verge of collapsing. The world is changing. The largest wildfires in the state of California. Tonight, the rain is over, but the disaster is not. I worry sometimes when I think about my future. What will it be like when I grow up? Would it be like what my parents remember? Climate change scares me. But we know that it doesn't have to be this way. We can change. That's why I'm grateful for Blue Planet Foundation. For the past 10 years, Blue Planet has been leading the way for clean energy. They think if we can do it in Hawaii, we can show the entire world what a clean energy future looks like. They brought together hundreds of students, just like me, to be a part of the change. They joined their families and neighbors to draw the line on climate change. Our voices really matter, and us being here today is showing something and showcasing to the world that we really care about this issue and we want to take a stand. And in 2015, their efforts paid off when Hawaii passed our country's first 100% renewable energy law. It's nice to know when I grow up, all our energy will come from clean sources. And now Blue Planet is growing. The Repower Project is working to bring Hawaii's 100% renewable energy law to other states. Now Blue Planet is active every day, making this change happen. They are in our classrooms and in our communities. We still have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. I'm excited about the new future we are creating. We can help solve our climate crisis, starting in Hawaii, and we'll inspire the world. But we can't do it alone. Will you help? For my future, So the first thing I did was I, I formed the foundation and I went and talked to the, um, uh, the governor of Hawaii at the time, Linda Lingle. And I said, you know what, uh, what I really want to do is I want to, um, uh, told her my plan that I was going to uh, end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii. And she said to me, you really don't know what you're talking about, do you? And I said, well, I may not know what I'm talking about now, but I will know what I'm talking about uh, when I get going. And uh, so how did we go about doing all the things that we did? And we did a whole bunch of things. And the, the answer is that we tried everything. And then we, we would try a bunch of things and we would see what worked and what didn't work. And we would do more of what worked and, what, and, and stop doing what didn't work. Uh, to get the people on our side, the first thing we did is we empowered uh, elementary school children to, um, by giving them 300,000 light bulbs to go door to door and exchange those light bulbs, thereby starting a conversation between a child and an adult about what the energy future should be and why, why light bulbs are such an important part of it. Turns out you can save 90% of your, uh, your lighting electricity by switching to light bulbs, I mean to uh, LED light bulbs. <clears throat> The second thing we did was a project called the Blue Line Project because, you know, people don't have, a, don't have a, a concept of what's actually going on with sea level rise. Uh, they think, well, it's not really going to affect them and, and so on and so forth. So we had junior high school uh, students draw on sidewalks with blue uh, chalk where 
high tide would be in a one meter rise in sea level. And we got the news out, we got the governor to come out, we got a lot of people, we got a lot of fanfare. And at the end of that, at the end of that exercise, pretty much everybody in Hawaii knew that Waikiki and a lot of Honolulu was going to be underwater in a one meter rise in sea level, which is the minimum rise in sea level, level predicted by the IPCC. The third thing we did is, is we, we tried to help the people on the outer islands. And I guess this is a, a problem in, in most islands. These people had very old refrigerators, uh, energy inefficient. And of course, if you buy a new refrigerator, an energy saver refrigerator, you will save a lot of money on the electricity. So we made a deal with General Electric and we brought in container loads of refrigerators at cost and exchanged them for existing, you know, it was, it was minor, a minor cost. I mean, people would be able to pay for the cost of the refrigerator in, in electricity savings in about a year. So who wouldn't uh, want that deal? So we got the people on our side. And then we, do, we started doing what we do best, which is we create legislation and we lobby. We create legislation and we lobby. We do a lot of it. And so we've created all kinds of, uh, of uh, how can I say, bills. Some of them got through, some of them didn't get through. And I'll get into a list of, of the ones that got through or a partial list anyway. The other thing that we did is we interviewed in the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC. So when the electric company says, I want to do blah, we say, uh, wait a minute, the people probably don't need you to do blah. You know, like the PUC approves all rate, hi uh, rate hikes or new projects that the electric company wants to do. Or in fact, the PUC does a bunch of different things besides uh, just energy. But we're uh, energy focused. Our focus is 100% renewable energy. So we... Um, one of the things that we did was we uh, created a barrel tax. Uh, for, every for every barrel of oil that's imported in Hawaii, uh, there's a dollar tax added to it, and that dollar goes to food security and renewable energy. Well, it used to anyway until we got into financial trouble. Now it's in the general fund. We'll have to go and fight for it again. But our biggest uh, success, of course, was the 100% mandate. And we, asked, we were asking for 100% by 2040, uh, the IPCC always talks about 2050, so our legislator says, we'll give you 100% by 2050, and we negotiated and negotiated and negotiated, and finally we managed to get it through 100% by 2045. Now, 2045, what's the big deal about 2045? Well, it turns out my son told me, hey, you know what, Dad, this is the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. Wow. What better success story for the world than for us all to have solved climate change by the 100th anniversary of the United Nations? So you can't just pass a mandate and expect everything to just fall into place. You have to follow it up by other actions. And so one of the actions was we, we created something called community solar. Uh, community solar works this way. If you don't have a roof that, that where the sun shines, like if you're li living in a building or if you're in the shadow of a mountain, then community solar allows you to put your solar panels somewhere else on somebody else's roof. So there could be a field with solar panels that belong to people that don't live there. And that way they can get the benefit of having renewable energy and solar energy without having it on their roof because they can't for, for whatever reason. Um, so we, the other thing is that we, the, the big deal is we changed the business model of the electric company. The electric company traditionally makes 10% on top of the price of oil. When we change that business model to they get to make more money the quicker they change to renewables. And guess what, that hap what happens after we did that? Oh, gee. The last year, the electric company came up with an RFP, a request for proposal for 800 megawatts of renewable energy. That's pretty much half of Hawaii. So first you have the mandate, then you have the people who are actually in the business of generating that energy, work on and figure out how to do it. And then you let them get on with it because they're the ones who know how to do it. I'm not, we don't tell the electric company you have to do this. We just tell them that it's gotta be done by 2045. And guess what? Not 
months after we passed the mandate, the electric company came out and said, you know what, we actually looked at it and we figured out we can actually do it by 2040. Right on electric company. So what else did we do? Or what else do we do? We have, um, we have a yearly student energy summit. It's a two day gathering where 200 students from all of the islands get together and discuss how we can achieve uh, renewable energy uh, in Hawaii and maybe in the world. <clears throat> The other thing that we do is we have, uh, uh, we train car salespeople because when, when I started, it was first all about the utility and electricity. And then I asked my guys, how, how, how effective have we been? Have we reduced the amount of oil that we import in, into Hawaii? And they sheepishly said, no, actually it's flat. And I said, what do you mean it's flat? We have reduced the amount of electricity that people use. Yeah, but in that same time, the oil price went down a bit and people started buying SUVs and driving them. And so whatever we saved in electricity was made up by, by internal combustion cars. And I'm, we're going, oh my gosh, we have to do something about ground traffic. In, in, in Hawaii, we spend $4 billion, $5 billion a year on oil. 40%, sorry, 30% goes to jet fuel, 30% goes to ground transportation, and 30% goes to, 40% goes to electricity. So the ground transportation is 30%. So the answer to that is electric vehicles. Hello. So we're training uh, car sales because every car company now has an electric car coming down the pipe. We um, created a, a program called Repower. And what Repower does is it helps other states do what we did in Hawaii, which is to achieve a mandate of 100% renewable energy by 2045 or whatever date they can get away with. New York State actually got, it, got a mandate of 2040. California copied us and, and they're 2045. And thank you very much, Guam. You have been our latest success in that you have achieved a mandate of 100% by 2045. So, Blue Planet Research. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about uh, what I do. Um, I have a ranch on the Big Island, and it's called Pu'u Va'a Va'a Ranch. And Pu'u, va, pu'u means hill, Va'a Va'a means canoe. I think this is where they used to get the, the wood to make the canoes to, to go back to Tahiti or wherever they came from. Um, my ranch, it's about 28 acres. It's an island. It's an island of 28 acres surrounded by 100,000 acres of conservation land. And to find out what sustainability looks like, the first thing we did was let's make us energy independent. And so what we did was uh, we created the energy lab. You can see the energy lab here. Um, but the energy lab is next, yeah, the energy lab is a research facility where we study sustainability. So the first thing we did was we took the ranch off grid. We spent about a year uh, working with vanadium redox flow batteries and they were a disaster. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, they didn't work anymore and we had to get rid of them. Actually, they're still here. We still have that chemistry, uh, evil chemistry at the ranch. But then we, I said, let's search for a chemistry that is um, benign because uh, I, I just don't like the idea of having poisonous chemicals at my ranch that might someday leak somehow. Uh, we narrowed it down in the end to um, lithium ferrous phosphate made by Sony and nickel cobalt manganese, which is still lithium, lithium nickel cobalt manganese made by Tesla. And my guys went to visit the uh, factory where they make the power wall and they went to visit the Sony factory in Japan. And they came back and they said, no, no question. The answer is lithium iron phosphate. And I said, why? The reason is, is because lithium iron phosphate does not get hot. So it doesn't need a cooling system. And the question goes, what happens when the nickel cobalt manganese batteries get too hot? They catch on fire. And this is not a fire that you can put out with a fire extinguisher or a, or a fire hose. This is the kind of fire that you, the, the uh, firefighters are told don't go near it, just wait until it's done. It's like fireworks. And so, the, so if you've got uh, a power wall or, or 
or, or bigger battery that has the nickel cobalt manganese, you need to have a cooling system. And the cooling system is moving parts. And I think moving parts are the enemy of islands because islands have a very corrosive atmosphere. And so anything that you have that has moving parts will stop working. And I, I, I'd hate to see a battery installation stop working or catch on fire because the parts stop moving. So our batteries, the batteries that we chose for, um, for my ranch and then uh, my house in Honolulu uh, are lithium ferrous phosphate. And uh, so this is a view of my garage uh, in Honolulu. It's me standing by my uh, three banks of Blue Ion 1.0. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's Sony. It looks like stereo equipment. Uh, everything else on the right is inverters and charge controllers and things I don't even understand because it's electronics. Um, but that is 60 kilowatt hours and that is enough. I have, a, I have a fairly large home in Honolulu and that is enough to run the entire house day and night. Um, so what, what's, what did we do next? We, um, we made something, we, we, we tried to find out what else can we do that's bigger? And so we came up and designed something called, the, we call it the Blue, Blue Ion M class. And the Blue Ion M is a 20 foot container that contains a megawatt, that's a thousand kilowatts, a megawatt of batteries. This particular battery bank will be used to, um, to provide power to our well. Our well goes down 2,400 feet. That's like 800 meters. That's where the water is. And, it, and, it, and we, we pull the water up and it uh, serves a community of about 120 homes. So it's not just our, my ranch, but it's a nearby community of 120 homes. So this is a pretty big installation. So now we're showing you that you can pump water. Again, we have a field of, of, uh, of solar panels that charge the batteries and then the batteries run the pump. And then um, basically now you have a water system that doesn't require grid electricity. Um, lastly, if, we, if you're off grid and we, we found this out, <laughs> You have to build your system so that it's big enough so it'll work on a cloudy day. And so what happens on a sunny day? On a cloudy day, you get barely enough to, to charge the battery to 100%. On a sunny day, by mid-morning, you have already completely charged your batteries. And basically, at that point, you're throwing energy away because the panels are still generating, but you have no use for it. So... This is not only a problem for us at the ranch, but it's a problem for islands. If we were to take islands off grid and um, create a situation where they're 100% renewable by solar, then you have times of day when you have extra energy. What do you do with it? Well, we decided to make hydrogen with that excess energy. And hydrogen is not only a backup fuel, which means that when you have multiple cloudy days and you don't have enough light or sunlight to charge your batteries, you can use the hydrogen, you can turn it back into electricity and charge the batteries using something called a fuel cell. On the left side of this picture is an electrolyzer and we are capable, if we were to run the electro, electrolyzer full time to make 12 kilos of hydrogen per day. And on the right side, you see our hydrogen fueling station, which is waiting for a hydrogen vehicle uh, so not only do we, can we use it as a backup fuel for the ranch, but we can also use it as a transportation fuel. And that is the answer to, to uh, islands uh, transportation. Sedans, electric cars are fine because you don't need so much, they're not so heavy duty. But trucks and buses, electric is just not enough. It takes too long to charge. And so hydrogen trucks and buses are the way to go. So the future is 100% electric because a hydrogen car or hydrogen truck or bus is still an electric car and it doesn't require any fossil fuel. So you can use the excess uh, solar energy, the uh, renewable energy that you produce on your island to create hydrogen, which is then the transportation, transportation fuel. So what do we do at the, at, at the energy lab? We try many things. People send us or ask us to test uh, something which new, a new technology which how can I say they they think it's going to work but they haven't tried it yet or they've tried it under laboratory condition but they haven't tried it on, on a working condition so it's basically our a research lab where we get to try things 
And one of the things that we tried, and this, this uh, came up after I went to Puerto Rico and found out that people, some people still didn't have electricity after like a year or more after the hurricane. So what's up with that? And, and the answer is, is that there's only so many trucks that can like put the wires back. And of course, the poor people on the, at the end of the line are going to be the last ones to get their electricity back. So during the emergency, what happened was people lost electricity, people lost the ability to communicate because their phones stopped working, their cell phones stopped working, and then they had a water problem. So uh, I decided, we decided that we should try to build something which could be used in an emergency. And we call it the cube. The cube is a, um, the cube, there, there's a picture of the cube deployed. The cube is an eight foot container that contains 32 panels. And basically the idea is that you could drop a cube in by truck or by helicopter uh, into a situation and then open the doors, take out the panels. And in three hours later, you have a little power station. So everything is contained in the container. We even included satellite dish so that we could have Wi-Fi. So to test the cube, we took it to Burning Man. Now, I don't know how many of you know what Burning Man is. It's a festival. And there's lots and lots of art exhibits at the festival. And we powered the largest art exhibit at, uh, at the Burning Man called The Folly. And this is, um, there were 400 light bulbs. There were lots of little stores. There was a courtyard on the inside. And basically, hey, this is like a village. This is a village. And we powered the village for, for seven days, day and night, using only our uh, cube with our power, uh, with our solar panels. So after working on uh, um, taking my ranch off grid and taking my ho house off grid, other people started asking me, can you help me also go off grid or stay off grid? And so we said, sure. And so we ended up helping other people and that turned into a business. And so now we're uh, talking about a business that I started. You know, I guess I'm, a, I'm a, an entrepreneur, so everything ends up being a business at some point. Um, we have a company called Blue Planet Energy. And Blue Planet Energy took our first prototype of a 16, it's a competition for the Powerwall, a 16 kilowatt hour product called Blue Ion 2.0. 1.0 was in my garage. 2.0 is selling all over the place. We have actually, it's a, it's a very robust business. Um, we started in Hawaii thinking that Hawaii was our main market because we had the most expensive electricity in the country. But we soon found out that people on the mainland also needed to be off grid or stay off grid. So very quickly, our, our, uh, most of our customers, customers ended up being on the mainland. And then what happened is uh, the hurricane in, uh, in Puerto Rico happened. And after the hurricane, everybody started because the, the electric company not only didn't connect, but the electric, even if, if you were connected, the electricity went on and off. And so everybody has diesel generators, which are noisy, smelly, dangerous, and expensive. And so that became our next market. And then the Red Cross came. The Red Cross asked us to, um, to help them retrofit uh, 114 schools that failed as emergency shelters. Why did they fail? If you have an emergency shelter, a school that is supposed to work as an emergency shelter, and the power goes off, nothing happens at night. You can't feed people, you can't sleep people, you can't do anything. If you, there's, no, there's no light in the bathroom. So what we did uh, with the Red Cross is we put six Blue Ion 2.0s in each school 114 schools, and, and the local solar uh, installers put solar panels on the roofs. There is, there is an example of solar on the roof and some of our batteries in the, in the basement of the school. Um, the Red Cross chose our batteries over all the other batteries because ours do not produce toxic fumes if there is a fire, or they never catch on fire. So Red Cross is, of course, concerned with safety. Now. I'm a big fan of Tesla myself. I have four Tesla cars um, and, and I would have chosen Tesla, but in my house, I think safety is more important. So safety being the most important thing, I don't want to have a battery in my house that's ever going to catch on fire for any reason. 
and I don't need ludicrous mode in my house. It's great for my car, I can show it up to my friends, but in my house, I want safety. So where do we go from there? Our next product is, uh, is a more industrial product for larger installations. And I, uh, it's called Blue Planet, it's called Blue Ion LX. And Blue Ion LX, it's high voltage, it's 64 kilowatts. Actually, you're looking at two of them next to each other. That's probably 120, 28 kilowatts. But basically now we're able to do uh, grid scale storage because you can line these things up and have plenty of them. So where do we go from there? The last thing um, that, I, that I need to talk about is um, Blue Planet Alliance. And Blue Planet Alliance is the latest thing, as Amanda said, it's the latest thing that I'm involved in. Um, and I started thinking about how we, what we did in Hawaii in, in terms of the mandate and then how we helped other states and other territories uh, of the United States with the mandate. The problem is that we're only 6% of the population of the world. And basically it, to solve climate change, everybody has to change, not just us. And I'm not saying that we're any faster than any other country because we are not even in the Paris Accord right now, but we're doing it anyway, by the way, we're doing it anyway. So the, what the, the concept of the um, Alliance was uh, to have other countries, and I would say starting with island states like yours, to have the mandate because you, the islands of the world, will be the most affected by climate change of any jurisdiction. So you need to, you need to be the most concerned about this. So it's two years ago and this beautiful woman from uh, New Zealand, uh, Amanda Ellis, comes to my office and brings with her the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. I wasn't even there, but somehow I got invited to speak at their next uh, assembly. The Interparliamentary Union is a gathering of 187 countries. They meet twice a year, they have an assembly. Each country gets to speak for seven minutes. And uh, they gave me 15. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I, but I did my 15 minutes. After that, and I didn't know this was gonna happen, they get to declare a, an emergency. Every, every assembly, they get to declare an emergency. And the small island, island developing states, some of you are, some, are SIDS countries, uh, got together and they wanted climate change to be the emergency. And they tried before and failed a number of times, but this time climate change became the emergency. I felt, and they, they, they said, they thanked me for the speech because it flipped everybody, or it, so it felt. And I felt like, oh, I felt like Superman. The next day I was in a room with uh, 14 other countries working on drafting this, the, 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 uh, the wording. And uh, uh, somebody said, we must maintain leadership uh, on fighting climate change. And I, I said, I'm sorry, um, if you want to maintain leadership in something, you must first take leadership. And they changed the words. They changed all the words that I asked them to change. So the resolution turned out to be a really nice resolution. Well, I spoke at uh, that um, IPU uh, gathering. I spoke again in, in uh, COP24 uh, in Katowice, Katowice, and then uh, they asked me to come to Doha. Now they said, you won't be able to speak because you've already spoken twice, but guess what happened in Doha? The emergency was a, a cyclone in Mozambique. And so the cyclone in Mozambique being a climate change related event, they said, you got four minutes. And this is what I did with my four minutes. Next video, please. My sincere condolences to the people who suffered the wrath of mother nature. This is unfortunately only the beginning, and we are still behaving as though nothing is really wrong. We know climate change is co caused by coal, oil, and gas, yet we continue to increase production. We know we are destroying the world our children will have to live in. How dare we do this? Are our differences so great 
that we cannot agree to save our children? Is our selfishness so great that we sacrifice the lives of our children so we can drive a nicer car or watch a bigger television? Cyclone Idai in Africa is not an extreme weather event. It is the new normal. If we don't ask, act decisively, the much more extreme storms of the future will make us wish for the extreme weather events of today. You parliamentarians are the chosen ones. Your people chose you to be their leader, so lead. The path to survival of our children is clear. We must stop producing more carbon dioxide than nature can absorb. We must change our way of life. We must use only renewable sources of energy. We must decide on a deadline by when we must complete this change. We must become 100% renewable by 2045. The bl we have formed an alliance to achieve this goal. The Blue Planet Alliance will achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. You and your governments must pledge to achieve 100% renewable energy in your country by 2045. Your children are asking you to help them. Be leaders. To, do to join the alliance, all you have to do is get your country to pledge to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. This is the greatest battle humankind has ever fought. We will be victorious. We must. For our children. Thank you. So what should the Blue Planet Alliance do? And I started thinking about this um, in earnest and I traveled around the world to all kinds of conferences and, and, and met people and asked them, what should we do? And I, as many people as I met, um, that is how many uh, things to do that people came up with. Um, so we, but we did reach a consensus. And the consensus that we reached is the vision of the Blue Planet Alliance is that we should, uh, we should uh, create a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony. And in so doing, we, we include uh, garbage in the ocean. We include all, everything to do with sustainability. Um, so here we are. Um, it's now 2020. We're in the middle of a, a COVID pandemic. And for some reason, people have stopped traveling. And it's such a wonderful thing. Now we understand what uh, the future could look like. Because if we lived like this, and if we continue to live like this, I know, of course, we can't do it exactly this way, but if we just don't go back to the way things were before the pandemic, we will actually be able to achieve all of the things we need to achieve to fix climate change and everything else by 2045. So that is my goal, is to fix not only climate change, but everything else that's wrong with the planet. Every place where we're out of balance, we should be getting into balance and we should learn how to live in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Hank. You're always an amazing inspiration. And as Dr. Christ pointed out, there's such a relationship between COVID and climate that we absolutely need to do what you have said and to be building back better and building back sustainably. You have done so much in terms of influencing policy change, you have youth at the table, and you're coming up with the technological solutions too. So I, given time is short, I'm just going to ask you to leave everybody with one thought. Lots of people in the chat room are asking, how can they join the Alliance? Could you let everybody know how they can become part of this movement? And we'll hand back to Lauren. So we are working on our website. Uh, we tried to get it done in time, but it turns out it takes more time. 
So please come and visit, visit us at blueplanetalliance.org. That's blueplanetalliance, one word, dot org. It should be ready in a couple of weeks. That's how you join. Or you can have a mandate for your country of 100% renewable energy, of course. <laughs> and Hank, I've just, I've just been told there's not time for questions from the chat room or from the respondents. We have some special things happening. So okay. just let everybody know that there will be a workshop uh, to help promote this mandate of 100% renewable energy for islands. And we've been talking in the chat room about that. And to thank you, just finishing with a quote from Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, who spoke last week and said, the most important thing we need to do is empower change agents. And you are just the most impactful change agent I have met. So a huge thank you, mahalo, aloha, and uh, Godspeed, keep doing this wonderful work. And handing back to Lauren now. Thank you so much to those of you who sent in engaging and thoughtful questions. Hank is sticking around and we're gonna start yeah. off the virtual yeah. reception with a couple of responses and gonna be... to your questions. Hank, I hear you have a special certificate that you would like to present to the governor, uh, to Governor Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio and the 35th Guam Legislature. Yes, I do. And uh, do we have a, is there a way for us to see the, um, the certificate? There you go. So this is uh, the Blue Planet Alliance uh, Certificate of Commitment. Uh, and this is being presented to uh, Lou Leon Guerrero, governor of Guam, for your commitment to making Guam a 100% renewable energy community by 2045. Furthermore, we welcome you as the newest member of the Blue Planet Alliance. Thank you very much. Congratulations. And we've also got a recognizing, go back. Yeah, Joshua Tenorio, the Lieutenant Governor of Guam and the legislature of Guam. So all of you who work together uh, to make the, uh, the mandate a reality, thank you very much. And you are officially members of the Blue Planet Alliance, creating a world in which humanity lives in harmony with nature. So that's it for me. I'm sorry I ran out of time and, and I would have loved to have answered some of your questions. But I think we have more time later. Yes, so Senator Amanda Shelton, as the main author of Public Law 35-46, Committing Guam to 100% Renewable Energy by 2045, I hear you have a special presentation for Hank as well. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you very much, Hank, for that presentation. You've been such an inspiration for us here on Guam, and we thank you for your continued work. Uh, we have a resolution to present to you. We were really hoping that this would happen live uh, in this year's conference. Uh, last year, uh, Senator Clint Rogel and I, he's also on the line, he's my uh, co-sponsor for the bill. Uh, we uh, announced at last year's conference that we introduced a bill uh, to get us to a 50% renewable energy goal. But with the help of our colleagues, we were able to amend that bill and uh, up the goal to 100%. So our mandate is 100%, as you said. So that's a, a very uh, proud accomplishment for the both of us, I know. So we have a special resolution for you. Uh, that is Resolution 325 of the Guam Legislature relative to recognition recognizing Mr. Hank Rogers for his commitment to the mission of stewarding the environment, most notably through clean energy, and commending him for his service as a global leader and inspiring Guam to be more ambitious in our own journey toward reducing our dependency on fossil fuels. So Mr. Rogers, thank you very, very much. And I just like to also give a minute to my co-sponsor for this resolution and for uh, the legislation for the 100% mandate, Senator Clint Rogel, to give a few words as well. Yes. All right. Hi, uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you very much for participating today. You're a huge inspiration to us. And uh, so that's why we'd like to, of course, present you with this resolution. I just like to thank um, you for taking the time out to talk to us and hopefully you can help us out with the next stage that you kind of talked about in uh, your presentation today which is also very critical which is sort of the implementation stage once uh, a mandate's been set i'm happy we've set the mandate and 
I hope that uh, we can work together somehow so you can help us out with the implementation stage. I really like what you said earlier about how um, it kind of had a lot of the same similarities with the struggle we had here. You spoke about how in the beginning people kind of told you, do you even know what you're talking about? And you said, no, but I'll figure it out. So that's kind of the same thing we did here. <laughs> there was a lot of people who said 100% renewable was impossible. Um, we told them not only is it possible, it's now mandatory. So <laughs> anything you can do to help us uh, realize that and make it into a reality, we would appreciate. Thank you for all that you do. And please continue to do what you do. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again, uh, Senator Shelton and uh, all, all of our colleagues and everyone on Guam who helped us uh, make this possible to get the 100% renewable. And thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you, Senator Shelton and Sen Senator Rajel. And now we have the governor and Lieutenant Governor of Guam on the line. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, can you all hear me? Uh, I guess what I wanted to, as uh, Senator Rajel and Senator Shelton were talking about it, um, you know, this, uh, we have a unique situation where uh, their significant part of the elected leadership um, since the beginning of last year have been committed to uh, changing the paradigm and uh, moving to embrace renewable energy in an environment that really has been consumed uh, by a dependence on fossil fuels uh, ingrained in, uh, in um, the public infrastructure um, culture and ingrained in just the expectations of people. And I think that um, the efforts that the legislature has made, um, the progress that we've made, uh, and are working together to try and change the paradigm and uh, get people to start embracing um, renewables and how uh, to embrace our reality even though we're one of the most um, developed places in the Pacific, we are still in a very isolated place. And in order to um, take advantage of that and deal with that reality, we have to be able to um, use the uh, perspective we have and the authority we have as public leaders to shift government policy and embed public policy through law to uh, direct us to uh, renewables and to, and to set the standard. So thank you for the recognition, and we're looking forward to working with everybody, all the change agents that are uh, here in this um, realm and uh, others that are like-minded um, to continue the push. We still do have quite a lot of um, uh, issues here locally uh, as we look at infrastructure, but um, I think together with the leadership of the legislature and from the governor and I, and let me just apologize, she is still leading an operational meeting on, uh, meeting on COVID response. Uh, so she sends her regards and look forward to working with all of you uh, to realize um, and to make sure our island's moving in the right direction. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Lieutenant Governor, for uh, your remarks. And thank you, Senators uh, Shelton and Rajel. And thank you very much again to, to Hank Rogers for an amazing presentation uh, to share about um, all the great work that you're doing with the Blue Planet Foundation and Alliance. I'd like to just take a minute before Lauren um, transitions, transitions us into the virtual uh, reception where we'll have more time to all interact and perhaps get a few questions over to Hank. Uh, I just wanna give you a preview of what's happening next week, which will be week three of our University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. I just wanna share that the topic is going to be the circular economy. And we have a really amazing speaker for the, for, for the first one. Uh, it's going to be Andrew Morlet, who is actually the chief executive of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So he is the thought leader of, uh, around the circular economy, him and his team over at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's gonna be 12 a.m. in the United Kingdom, so unfortunately he's only gonna send us a quick video a message for a few minutes in the beginning of our session. Then the next one will be a panel uh, called Island Wisdom, Looping Back to the Circular Economy. So this concept of the circular economy where we um, design out waste and pollution and hopefully make green economic growth by taking waste products and uh, using it as resources to create new economic opportunities. We'll have an overview of how this relates and, and is relevant to islands. So we have Dr. Raj Butch from Arizona State University, Kosi Latu, the Director General of SPREP, Monica Guzman, who is the Executive Director of a local business incubator here, um, helping local entrepreneurs to transition to uh, circular economy business practices, and a research associate, Nate Maynard from Taiwan. And it'll be moderated by our chairwoman of our Island Sustainability Advisory Board, uh, Ms. Jackie Marati from the Bank of Guam. And 
then we'll have another panel right after. This whole program will be about an hour and a half. We'll have a circular economy around the islands uh, panel with some practitioners like uh, Matt Simpson, I know is on the line, the CEO of Green Banana Paper based in Costa Rica, Micronesia. We'll also have Jerry Winata and, uh, from Indonesia, an Obama leader, and also Rashwin Singh from uh, Malaysia, another Obama leader, showing really cool work that they're doing in the circular economy space with uh, moderation by Ms. Melanie Mendiola, the CEO of our Guam Economic Development Authority. So please uh, don't forget to uh, register for next week and we hope to see you again, same time, same Zoom link. All right, back to you, Lauren. I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors again for helping make this virtual conference series possible. Thank you all for attending week two of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. Don't miss next week's session on the circular economy, Friday, Guam time from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., which will be Thursday for those across the international dateline. Stick around for the virtual reception where I'll be joined by my co-host, Phil Cruz, the CIS Sustainability Coordinator. And if you can't make it, we hope to see you next week. See you as Maasi and have a great day. Biba Island Sustainability and Biba UOG. Hi, welcome back everyone from our short break. We are back for a question session with Hank Rogers. First, we'd like to call upon two respondents that we have um, in the gallery view right now. We have Dr. Annette Tyrone Santos, who would like to make a comment or a question to Hank Rogers. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rogers, for your uh, very inspiring and awesome presentation. Um, as you were giving your presentation, I was thinking about some of the things that we do at the University of Guam. Um, we have a Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, um, and we're trying to um, tie in themes of the circular economy. So today, I actually have a group of uh, business administration graduates that will be giving their capstone presentations uh, in their snake bit competition uh, surrounding the uh, circular economy. And uh, we also have a professional MBA program with this cohort actually uh, proposing a badge uh, certificate modeled after um, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and, um, and Dr. Austin Shelton has been an amazing partner uh, with us and um, trying to inspire them with the Guam Green Growth Initiative and has had many occasions to talk about the great work that you do. Um, and so I guess the question that I'd like to ask is, um, uh, how can we as an island um, and um, uh, a group of islands in Micronesia uh, create a compelling story so that we can um, create the narrative for all of our islanders to be on board with this initiative to live in harmony with nature as you, um, as you stated through your, throughout your presentation. And I'd like for you to give us some idea of how we might do that um, in consideration of our main um, industries of tourism and the military. Uh, and, and also, if you could share some of the lessons learned um, to help us narrow the learning curve um, towards putting into action some of the things that we're already planning for and um, uh, putting some legs on this initiative of 100% um, uh, of this 100% mandate in, in uh, 2045. So. I'd like to hear some of your comments and maybe some ideas of how to move forward. Yes, yeah, so um, I believe that going forward, more and more people, especially young people, are really not going to be that interested in, in uh, having a vacation that is going to uh, cause a, a, a huge carbon footprint. Uh, let's say that we plant enough trees to offset the air travel, which is what I'm doing, by the, by the way, in my own life. Um, what we need to do is once they land in your jurisdiction, in Guam, or one of your islands, they should not have any carbon footprint once they're there. And, and so then they can, they can have a guiltless vacation uh, on your beautiful island. So tourism, I think, is going to uh, move away from, uh, how can I say, uh, big carbon footprint uh, tours into much more eco-friendly uh, tourism. As far as the military is concerned, the military have their own problem. Their own problem is that um, they, uh, especially if there's some kind of a crisis going on, they have to move 
diesel or oil or whatever it is that they use for our energy around the world, they have to protect that stuff. And um, again, they have to, it, it's, it's a, um, a point of weakness for the military to have a supply line that they have to keep where they keep on sending diesel. So if you help them, and we're working with the military here in Hawaii also, uh, because they have a mandate, they have to be able to be energy independent for two weeks. Just in case something happens, they have to be energy independent. Well, what better solution to that is then have them go renewable altogether. They might as well become completely energy independent and not have to wait for a diesel shipment uh, from anywhere. And uh, as far as what can the islands do, your island, the islands can be examples. You know, here's the, the, the big vision is that there are islands all over the world uh, belonging to all kinds of different countries. And if the people in each of those countries see their islands become energy independent, then they can see, oh my gosh, if they can do it on the island, why can't we do it here on the mainland? So we can be the example. Uh, and it's, it's very easy for us to achieve because an island economy is kind of a closed economy. You can actually measure everything that comes in and everything that goes out. And so we can make examples of all of the islands in the world to become energy independent and hopefully uh, become sustainable. I mean, garbage is a huge deal. I've been, I've been to Tuvalu and, and I, I saw the, 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 um, the garbage pit. Oh my gosh, the landfill. It just hurt me to see that on an island. You know, if you go back in time, islands, it was only uh, organic waste, but now it's plastic or metal or all kinds of other things. Uh, we have to find ways to recycle all of that into materials that can be used on the islands. And that's what we're working on next at Blue Planet Research. Next question. All right, we'll have our next question from Michelle Bucolo from Micronesia Climate Change Alliance. Have a day, Hank. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was a huge fan of Tetris growing up, and I really enjoyed learning about um, the work that you're doing at Blue Planet. And I know that a lot of people here have mentioned Guam going 100% renewable by 2045. And I think that's just as great, but to kind of uh, piggyback off what Senator Clint Rogel was saying, I think that we need, it's great that we're doing 100% renewable, but I also don't wanna forget the fact that our power company has just procured a 180 megawatt power plant and that is going to potentially lock us into climate disrupting fossil fuel use for the next 30 years. And our organization does a lot of on the ground, grassroots, base building, and trying to mobilize the community into climate action. We went up against the power plant. We got a, a couple thousand signatures. Um, obviously, it's happening anyway. But I just wanted to see what advice do you have, if any, for community members and, and politicians um, to, cult, to, to, to cultivate more sustainability and to you know, encourage young people to heed the call to climate action? Well, the, the way I look at it, it, as far as the young people are concerned, it's their world that we're trashing. I mean, they have to live in it. And I, I, how, many, how many times do I have, have I talked to older people and say, oh, well, climate change is not my problem because I'm going to be dead by the time it really becomes an issue. Uh, uh, what about your children? And what about your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren? You don't care about them? Really? Really? Why did you have children? You know, what's the deal there? And so I remember when I was 17 years old and... I was about to become 18. They were going to send me to Vietnam to fight in a war, which even if you look back at it now, why did we fight that war? For what? Why did all those people die? Why did we bomb all that stuff? It makes no sense. So we went, uh, we went out on the streets and we demonstrated until that war ended. And I really feel that young people need to get to the point where they get so angry that they don't let uh, the old people do things like build another fossil fuel, fuel power plant. Now, the, what probably went wrong in, in Guam, and I don't know the answer to this question because I'm, I'm not, I wasn't in, the, in the, the deal, is, you know, another fossil fuel, fuel power plant is just the easy solution. And, and 
but it's an addiction. Hello, it means that you're stuck 30 years, seriously? How do they work for the, for the mandate? So basically they can, have, they can build it in the last 30 years, but they're gonna have to turn it off after 25. That's what the mandate says. And so, by the way, by the time 25 years come, comes around, renewable energy will be so cheap that you won't be able to afford to import the oil. So I think eventually this problem solves itself, um, but uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, we should have organized ahead of time to get everybody out on the street and say, no, one, two, three, four, we don't want your power plant or whatever it is, you know, whatever your slogan is. But uh, it, it's very unfortunate. But we're talking here today to a bunch of other islands. And I just want to say that there is a better way and you can choose the better way. Don't do what Guam just did and, and, and build another power plant. We're, we're not building any more power plants in Hawaii. That's not gonna happen. And it's just, it just makes no sense, especially if it's gonna last well into the future. So protest. It looks like Matt Simpson has a question. Hi, Matt. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Yeah, sorry, that's the extraction machine on the background. But I just wanted to um, ask if Hank had done any work on food security or um, agriculture along with his, um, his project. Um, so food security is a much tougher thing because it, it generally requires land and it requires uh, knowledge that we've kind of lost. As, as food that's coming from other places is cheaper, um, it becomes more difficult to compete with that food that's coming from other places. Um, but one of the hats that I wear is I'm the Honorary Consul of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to, Ho to Hawaii, Guam, and the Northern Marianas, by the way. And in that capacity, I went to, to the Netherlands to find out what's so good about the Netherlands. And Netherlands is a country not much bigger than, uh, than Hawaii, and yet it has uh, it's the second largest exporter of ag product in the world. Now, how do they do that? It's a $100 billion export industry. Of course, a lot of it is flowers, but it, what they do is they grow it indoors um, in greenhouses, and they've come, become really, really efficient at growing those things indoors. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to learn how to grow food uh, in those kind of captive situations. Um, which don't require so much land and don't require so much water. They save 90% of the water and they re recycle everything. All the water and all the nutrients get, get reused in that situation. And so I think that that's probably an island solution for food security going forward. Great, thank you, Hank. And now we'll cut over to Elsa Dumulanare, who is an Associate Director of <laughs> CIS. Hi Hank, great presentation, thank you. Um, we here at home have solar, but we're connected to the grid uh, with Guam Power Authority, and I think almost all people who have uh, solar on Guam are connected to the grid. And I was wondering, um, would you recommend home, homeowners to get their own batteries, or is that something that would be a responsibility more of you know, the Power Authority? Yeah. So what happened in Puerto Rico and what happens any, any place where you are grid tied is that when the grid goes down, the electric company won't let you use your panels because while they're fixing the grid, they can't have any electricity going into the grid. And so all of the places that had panels in Puerto, Puerto Rico after the hurricane, they were useless because they were all grid tied. Now, if you're living in a place where that's not an issue, then yeah, then probably you could go grid type. But if, if you're either far away from the grid where it's expensive to bring a line to your house, or if you're at all concerned about, about maintaining power, even, even though there's a power outage, and in some places the power goes out on some regular basis, then it's good. What we did for the schools in Puerto Rico is they're grid tied. So most of the time they're still getting their power from the grid or they can, but it's called islanding. So when the emergency happens, you can pull a switch and then it becomes 100% off grid, which means that it's disconnected from the grid part of the time with batteries. Um, I don't know exactly know the price of your electricity, but 
a rule of thumb for me is how, however much you paid for your solar panels, that's how much you should pay for your batteries to be off grid. And then again, you can do the calculation to see how long it will take, take you for to get a return on your investment. Hank, it's Amanda. I wanted to follow up on that. That solution in Puerto Rico was such a wonderful disaster risk resilience solution as well. Having the schools with panels and then being able to look after people when there is a disaster. What do you think might be able to be done in Hawaii to do the same kind of thing to turn schools into disaster risk centers? It's just a political just decision, first of all. Um, I mean, I, I don't see how the government can uh, re be responsible for emergency shelters that completely fail when the hurricane happens. So we in Hawaii, um, you know, we had Hurricane Aniki in the 90s or 80s or 90s, a long time ago. And so we could see what, what it can do to an island. And we used to get two or three named hurricanes per year, like in between us and Mexico heading our way. Now we have like 12, 13. So the, the number has vastly increased because of uh, the ocean has become warmer, which causes hurricanes. Um, and so it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And, you know, in Puerto Rico, they're still cleaning up after that disaster. And, and we should be working on this now before it ever happens. Because if a couple of big cables go down, those are not easy to replace. Those are going to be people without electricity for a long time. And schools are the places that need to have that kind of uh, uh, resilience. And I did speak to um, the electric company, Scott CU, actually, the new CEO of the electric company in Hawaii. And yeah, we're thinking along the same lines that we want to uh, put, work with the electric company, put PV and storage in all the schools and have them actually work as emergency shelters. That would be a good thing. That would be a really good thing. Uh, I'm like volunteering to help. There you go. Uh, one more thing. Um, I was in uh, New York meeting with the ambassador to the United States, I guess, uh, from Fiji. And uh, I was showing him the cube and you know, how, it, how it's enough power for a, small, a, a big house or a small village, depending on where you are in the world. And he said, you know, I have um, schools in Fiji on remote islands where there's no electricity. Yeah. There's no electricity. And if there's no electricity, it means there's no internet. And he actually had tears in his eyes. He says, we're teaching our children how to live in the last century. How can, they be, how can you expect them to compete if they don't have access to power, energy, or knowledge? Those are the two things that we all take for granted in, in the developed world, but still there are still plenty of places. So um, I would really like to work with islands to electrify the most remote islands and make sure that no children get left behind. Fantastic, thank you. Follow up. Thank you, Hank, for answering that question. So now our next question comes, um, we'll go to Minyaka de Oro from the Micronesia Climate Change Alliance. Hi, Hapade, Hank, and everyone, and um, especially the UOG CIS for putting this together, even though we can't be together. Um, I would like to know, Hank, you are a business person, so what role and responsibility does the business sector have in meeting this energy goal? And what call to action do you have for business owners? We here at MCCA um, do a lot to mobilize our communities and influence policymakers to, to about renewable solutions for the climate crisis, but what role does the, um, what role does business, does the business sector have? So the, the business sector has, has a big role. And I see going forward, again, um, I think, especially starting with young people, but um, continuing on with concerned people, is that I, as a citizen or a consumer, uh, will buy a product only from the most eco-friendly company. So, so this information, not everybody has, but eventually everybody will have that. And there are companies in the world right now that are cleaning up their supply chain and making sure that there's no nothing like child labor or fossil fuel or whatever the evil things that, that exist in the supply chain uh, that create the products that they sell. Um, because the customers are going to demand that. 
So it's a matter of time. If you, if you want to be in business in 2045, you better figure out how to clean up your act. And, uh, and, and by the way, business people have children too. And so those children really uh, should put pressure on their parents to clean up their act. Frankly speaking, uh, because of the resilience issue and because of the cost of fossil fuel and then the, the cost of mitigating climate change, um, renewable energy and, and a circular economy are cheaper in the long run, much cheaper. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're borrowing from our children so that we can have a little bit of more money now. What good is it if we trash the environment while we're doing that? So business... Hi, sorry, we had a technical difficulty. We froze for a little bit. I hope that didn't interrupt your viewing so much. Someone, Marcel on the chat. Uh, Marcel is asking, what do you say to youth or other adults who feel like saving the environment is a hopeless cause? I think that's a very burning question that a lot of people have. It's definitely not a hopeless cause. Humanity, or, uh, Hitler or something like that, we can solve this problem. There is, there is no, for me, it's not a question. There's no hopeless in this equation because we can definitely do it. And right now, because of COVID, we can see that we can actually live a different way. If we just don't go back to the way things were, I think we're well on the way to achieving um, climate resilience and climate uh, regenerate the, re regenerating the environment. Okay. Thank you, Hank, and everyone who stuck around for the reception, which turned into a quest question and answer session. Um, our internet connection is getting a little more unstable, so we're going to have to end the show now. Thank you again, Hank and Amanda and everyone who's attended. Um, you've all been great. And we'll see you next week at 9 a.m. Guam time for our session on the circular economy. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. This is Matthew, everyone.